it will start live and just really welcome to i focus online episode 350 and 25th on oculoplasty module today we have with us dr ramesh murthy sir from xsi clinic pune to speak to us on congenital lacrimal anomalies and congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction a brief introduction for dr ramesh murthy sir sir is currently working as a senior consultant in xsi clinic pune his areas of interest include cataract squint low vision aids and oculoplasty sir did his mbbs from afmc pune and dnb from arvind i hospital madurai sir did his fellowship from prestigious lv prasad i institute hyderabad and murfields i hospital london sir has received frcs and was the youngest person to receive honorary faico sir has total 131 publications to his name in various international and national journals sir has given 760 oral plus poster presentations in 21 countries sir is also recipient of 34 awards in his medical careers including five from aao he is a reviewer of archives american journal british journal iobs oprs and jpos sir has been a member of aao invited board member of american academy of pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus Sir has been also executive committee member of Oculoplastic Association of India and Pune Ophthalmological Society. We invite you, sir, and over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Roju, for your uh, kind words. Uh, so today we'll be talking about congenital lacrimal anomalies and the congenital nasal lacrimal duct obstruction. So I'll just share my screen first. Uh, so is my screen visible yes sir and i'm audible yes sir thanks so uh, the broad topic is lacrimal disorders in children so uh, so when we talk of congenital lacrimal anomalies we have anomalies of the sac so you could have a diverticulum which is an out pouching or a pouch inside the sac one could have a fistula which is connecting the sac to the skin there could be anomalies of the puncta which could be congenital atresia so by the word atresia we mean that it is a opening uh, which is extremely narrow which is not opened at all there could be supernumerary that is more than one or there could be a double puncta there could be congenital slits in the punctum or there could be lateral displacement of the punctum especially in cases of down syndrome so apart from the anomalies of the sac and the puncta we could also have anomalies of the canaliculi So again, you could have an atresia that is a failure of uh, opening of the canaliculi, or a very narrow slit-like opening. There could be a failure of canalization, and this could be associated with anomalies of the punctum. In addition, one could also have anomalies of the nasolacrimal duct, an imperfect Hassner valve, or a non-canalization of the nasolacrimal duct, which is very common. So, what are the causes of these anomalies? So, it could be sporadic. There could be a genetic cause. prematurity could be a reason maternal drug abuse and when these problems are present other ocular abnormalities could be present in about 20% of cases and systemic abnormalities in 25% of cases so let's go uh, one by one with all these conditions so the first is the congenital lacrimal fistula so this is a rare developmental anomaly also called as a lacrimal enlarged duct by jones so this connects the sac or the common canaliculus to the skin it's usually asymptomatic and what you see is a small dimple inferior nasal to the medial canthus so one could also have a congenital fistula and we want to differentiate it from a acquired lacrimal fistula so this congenital fistula is usually pinpoint the usual location is about 2 mm inferior and medial to the punctum the skin surrounding it is usually normal and when we do a three point test that is we pass three probes one through the upper one through the lower punctum and through the fistula it is going to touch on the other hand the acquired fistulas are much larger there is usually a scar around this fistula and if you pass three probes one through the upper and one through the lower punctum and one through the fistula 
it is unlikely that they will meet. The location of the acquired fistula is anywhere and usually above the medial canthal tendon in tuberculosis and actinomyces. So how do we manage these cases? So we treat the symptomatic patients. We determine the patency of the nasolacrimal duct. If there is no obstruction, we excise the fistula. So we make a small incision around the fistula. We go deep inside, go along the track of this tube, right up to the region of the sac, excise it flush with the sac. We suture the sac with usually H0 vicarin. We suture the orbicularis over it and also then finally suture the skin. If we feel that there is an obstruction of the nasolacrimal duct, not only do we do a fistulectomy, we also perform an DCR with or without intubation. The next condition we'll discuss is congenital dacryocystocele. Now this occurs, especially in the newborn, with con because of concomitant obstruction of the valve of Rosenmuller and the lower obstruction in the region of the valve of Hassner. So this is a kind of large cystic swelling that is created because there's an obstruction here and an obstruction here. So the clinical features are a bluish medial canthal cyst. There is watering. It is slowly progressive and usually it occurs more in the girl children. Complications include infection, dacrocystitis, astigmatism and amblyopia is known to occur. There could be canthal deformities and airway obstruction can occur because there is a nasal extension and this is a serious abnormality which is life-threatening. So what are the differential diagnosis of a congenital dacrocystocele? So this congenital dacrocystocele is usually below the medial canthal tendon. On ultrasound, it is usually hollow and the aspirate is a serous fluid. On the other hand, the capillary hemangioma has a variable location. On ultrasound, there is high internal reflectivity and the aspirate is bloody. So this is the case of, of capillary hemangioma. As you can see, it is located here and with treatment of steroids, it has disappeared completely. The other entity which we need uh, to look for is an encephalocele. So an encephalocele is usually above the medial canthal tendon. It is usually hollow on ultrasound and the aspirate is cerebrospinal fluid. So this is a large encephalocele which you can see on the CT scan. The third entity is the dermoid cyst which you can see here. Again, variable location and it could be angular dermoids. And as you can see, it is having a variable uh, appearance on the ultrasound and the aspirate is usually very thick and a serous dirty fluid. So congenital seal in the short term, we can observe. We can do a lacrimal sac massage. We can do warm compresses. Early surgical intervention would include probing. If the probing is unsuccessful, one can definitely go ahead, do an endoscopy and resect this nasal cyst with a stent. And sometimes we, we can even syringe with saline to cause a nasal blowout of this seal. Now we look at the punctal and the canalicular anomalies. So the punctal anomalies include imperforate punctum. So there's usually a membranous obstruction which can be bypassed just by a simple uh, nettle chips punctum dilator. There could be punctal agenesis. So if it is usually single, it is associated with canalicular agenesis. And if it is bilateral punctal agenesis, there is a very high chance that there is presence of canalicular agenesis also. So in these cases, we can go ahead with doing a punctoplasty. So we can do a three snip punctoplasty or we can do a laser punctoplasty. Many times we might not find the patent uh, canaliculus after we do a punctoplasty. Sometimes there could be more than one puncta. If we notice that the punctum, uh, punctoplasty is successful and the canaliculi are patent, we can use a mini monoca stent and we can put the stent inside so that we can keep this passage open. In canalicular abnormalities, we have canalicular agenesis or canalicular stenosis. So congenital canalicular stenosis is very, very rare. Usually it is acquired in nature, which needs a treatment with the canalicular dilatation and we can put a stent inside. There could be congenital valve abnormalities also like an absent valve of Hassner. So this will cause a pneumatoceles of the sac. And when there is a nose blowing, there is a retrograde passage of air into the, into the uh, sac region. There could be an absent valve of Rosenmuller, in which case air can be blows from, blown from the nose to the eye. And if there are nose bleeds, this can give rise to bloody tears. Congenital dacrocystitis is the condition where there's infection in the lacrimal sac region. And most commonly this occurs because there is a nasolacrimal duct obstruction. So canalization of the nasolacrimal duct starts in the fourth month and it is complete by the eighth month. So 
So when there is failure of canalization of the nasolacrimal duct at the valve of Hasner, this particular congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction is going to happen. And this can uh, in turn give rise to dacrocystitis. So the incidence of nasolacrimal duct obstruction in term babies is 30%. In Down syndrome, it's about 22 to 36%. But a symptomatic block is seen in only 22 to 6 percent of cases. The onset of this condition is after three weeks of age because that is when the tearing starts. The clinical features include watering and discharge, chronic conjunctivitis, matting of the eyelashes, and the most important clinical sign is regurgitation on pressure over the lacrimal sac area. So the management is usually conservative. We take a swab from the sac regurgitant for culture and sensitivity. We give a presumptive topical antibiotic. And depending on this culture sensitivity report, we can always go ahead and change the antibiotic. But usually we advise a sac massage. This is called as a Krigler's hydrostatic massage. Where we are pressing down the sac contents so that it will drain towards the nasal cavity. So this sac massage is done about 10 strokes 4 times a day. So conservative management is effective and it can give rise to 90% cases resolving with just conservative management. The most common organisms in children with acute or chronic sac inflammations include Haemophilus influenzae, Staph aureus, Pneumococcus and beta hemolytic Streptococcus. In one of the studies in South India, it was noted that the commonest organism was Streptococcus pneumoniae followed by Haemophilus influenzae. Now, if there is failure of three months of conservative management or the child is over one year of age, one can go ahead with probing. Now, why this deadline of one year of age? Because it is noted that when the child is very young, say a few months of age, the chance of spontaneous resolution is very high. So when the child is one month of age, there is 96% chance of spontaneous resolution. But the, as the child grows older, when the child reaches the age of say 11 months, the chance of spontaneous resolution falls to just 5%. And when the child is about 12 months of age, the chance of spontaneous resolution is practically zero. Some groups advocate that one should go for an earlier probing between six to nine months of age. So the probing is done when we want to do the intraocular surgery. So say the child has got a cataract and we want to go ahead with cataract surgery. In this case, if there is a, a concomitant acute dacrocystitis, we cannot go ahead with surgery. So we should go for an early probing. If the child has repeated episodes of acute dacrocystitis, this could be an indication for early probing or an extremely symptomatic child or if there is a neonatal dacrocele. Now, these are the instruments that we normally require when we want to do a probing. The probing is ideally done under GA using a cuffed endotracheal tube. Some people would like to do it under restraint or even under sedation. A decongestion nasal spray is used to decongest the nasal uh, mucosa. There are different probe sizes which are used. So if the child is say between three months to less than one year of age, we can use a size zero probe. If the child is say less than three months of age, we can go for a two times zero probe. And in a new net, we can go for a three zero or a four zero probe. When the child is older, say one year and beyond, we go for a one size probe. And in a child who is much more older, maybe more than three years, or we want to do a reaming of the bony obstruction, we can go for a two-size probe. So how do you do this probing? We dilate the upper punctum first. And it is usually a vertical movement with slight middle angulation. And turn it 90 degrees, enter 2 to 3 millimeters. So uh, this is the probe which we introduce vertically. We stretch the lateral canthus, turn the probe horizontally until it hits the medial uh, bone, so we feel a hard stop. Then we release the lateral canthus and gently turn the probe vertically down, moving it slowly downwards, posteriorly and laterally. And when we feel the bony block, we try to bypass it. So let's look at the video of probing. So this is a child who has been put under general anesthesia. We have put a small suction canal through the nose to prevent any kind of fluids leaking to the nose. First, we dilate the upper punctum 
and gently we do a syringing. So when we do the syringing, we notice that there is a lot of regurgitation of muco pus. So there is an obvious block of the nasorachmal duct and the sac is full of uh, mucus and pus. The probe is now gently passed first vertically and then pulling the lid laterally, we are passing it horizontally till it, we can reach the hard stop. So once you feel the hard stop, we turn it gently downwards, outwards and laterally, gently advance. You don't have to go full thickness and gently move it until we bypass the block. So this is the spring back test. So it is firmly uh, placed inside the nasorectal duct. We can use a second instrument to feel the, the probe. We also do a syringing to confirm that we have done a proper probing, which has been successful. And this can be checked by the suction cannula, the fluid coming through the suction cannula. So probing position can be confirmed by the fact that the probe is flat on the forehead. It is aligned with the trochlea and there is a springing of the probe when we try to move it. We advance the probe till there is a hard stop. How do we confirm that the probe is in the nose? We pass a second metal instrument through the nose and we can feel the metallic probe or we should do a nasal endoscopy ideally and have a look at the probe actually coming through the nose. We can confirm the patency of the lacrimal system by syringing with nasal suction. We may have situations of difficult probing where our diagnosis is not correct. Suppose it is a canalicular block or a common canalicular block, we can have a difficult probing. If there is a false passage, we are going through the soft tissues, we could have a difficult situation or there is a tight bony obstruction. Now this tight bony obstruction could be within the nasolacrimal duct, in which case we can do a graduated or stepwise probing which means we start with smaller size probes and then gradually increase the size of the probes once we are able to bypass the block. The second is the reaming maneuver. So in the reaming maneuver, we pass the probe as if we are trying to pass a screw through a wooden board. So we pass the screw in a clockwise direction until we are able to bypass the block. If the block is beyond the nasolacrimal duct, then it is the, usually the inferior terminal which is the cause and we do an infracture that is move the inferior terminal towards the middle part of the nose. So this infracture of the middle terminal will open up this nasal cavity. Now all this should ideally be done under endoscopic guidance and we should have a clear visualization of what we are trying to do. The post-operative measures include using nasal decongestant, topical antibiotics, we ask to continue the sac massage and we always review the patient in four to six weeks. If we feel that there is some kind of problem and if the symptoms persist or if there is a failure, we can always repeat the probing anytime after six weeks. We can always go ahead with a second or a third probing and we should always consider other measures if these fail. Now, what is the effectiveness of probing? When we do the probing at the age of one year, there is about a 92% cases resolving. When we do the probing at the age of two years, about 89% of cases will resolve. Probing at the age of three years, about 80% will resolve. At the age of four years, about 71% of cases will resolve. And when the patient is about five years of age, only about 42% will resolve. And hence, there is an importance of early probing for children. Sometimes we have to do a nasolacrimal duct intubation. So indications for this include unsuccessful probing, or a difficult probing, or if you feel there's an abnormal nasal anatomy and the age of the child is more than two years. So what we use in this is a Crawford stent. Now this stent has got a small olive tip on this side and this is a retriever. So this is passed through the upper and the lower punctum and it is pulled out with this retriever from the nose. This stent can be left in the nose for a period of about six months and then it can be removed. The success of nasolacrimal duct intubation is about 85%. If you do a monocanalicular intubation, within two years, the success is about 97% and after two years, the success is about 90%. So overall, it is a successful procedure. So here you can see that we have passed the Crawford stent through the lower punctum, which you can see here. We're passing it through the upper punctum. This is the nasal endoscopic view which you're getting because we're doing it under endoscopic guidance. So this is a passage of the stent here. So this is the uh, two uh, tubes which are coming out and we leave it in the nose tight and leave it for a period of about six months in case of difficult probing or if it is a failed probing. 
So retention of tenants more than 12 months will usually lower the success rate. So the time for removal is usually between six months to 12 months. If the patient has Down syndrome or has an older age or of any kind of gender, it does not give rise to any kind of treatment failure. The most common complication of nasal lacrimal duct intubation is unplanned removal because there is a dislodgement of the tube in nearly 25% of cases. Balloon catheter dilatation is another technique where we dilate either the region of the valve of Rosenmuller or the region of the valve of Hassner by using an inflated balloon which is usually filled with sterile water. So what we do in the Becker technique is a probing first, infracture the inferior terminate if necessary. A deflated balloon catheter is introduced. We confirm the position by an endoscopy that it is positioned properly on the nasal floor. We attach the inflation device, fill it with sterile water. So in the region of the uh, valve of Hasner or the valve of Rosenmuller, that is in the region of the common canaliculus and near the region of the nasolacrimal duct, we try to inflate it and leave it uh, at a pressure about say 8 atmosphere for 90 seconds or 8 atmosphere for 60 seconds. This helps in dilatation of the nasolacrimal duct and the sac junction. So balloon catheter dilatation has a success of about 82% after failed probing. As a primary procedure, the success rate goes up to 80%. It is known to be effective in complex obstructions in older children. Pediatric dacrocystorhinostomy has is indicated when there is a failed stenting or failed balloon dactroplasty, or there is a complex bony obstruction which is un we are unable to bypass. The important anatomic differences between children and adults is flatter anterior and posterior lacrimal crests, a shallower lacrimal fossa. The ethmoidal air cells are more anterior. There are rapidly growing facial bones and the wound healing response is exuberant or very fast. Usually we do a pediatric DCR after three years of age once the facial growth has reached a particular level of uh, growth. Important operative considerations. The ostium size should be at least one centimeter. We prefer to use silicon stents in nearly all the cases with a nasal anchor. We have to be extremely aware about blood loss in children because the entire blood volume in a child is very less. We have to realize that there could be a failure of because there is anatomic obstruction of the ostium that we create by granulation tissue. And the success ranges between 79 to 96%. So these are the steps of a pediatric DCR. So under general anesthesia, one can always give a local block here to prevent bleeding and to reduce pain post-operatively. We instill nasal decongestant drops. A small curvilinear incision is made about 5 to 7 millimeters from the medial canthus, just above the medial canthus and in a curvilinear fashion along the anterior lacrimal crest. We go inside and we hit the bone and try to separate the orbicularis. Once we do that, we place this Casper retractor and try to look for the medial canthal tendon. Gently, we make an incision on the periosteum and we gently elevate this periosteum towards the lacrimal sac so that we have the sac on this side and here we can see the med the medial side we can see the uh, bone of the nose and the lacrimal and the ethmoid bones gently make a small hole we break the lacrimal bone and slowly we try to punch upwards so that we can make a nice ostium here and here you can see that this ostium has been made and we've got the nasal mucosa here. The sac is on this side. Once you've done that, we can make uh, a flap of this nasal mucosa. We can make two flaps or we can make just one anterior flap and we can always cut off the posterior flap. Here one can see that there is the sac flap. So this sac flap is again created. We cut off the posterior sac flap and we just use the anterior sac flap. And here is the nasal mucosa. So we can suture this sac flap to this nasal mucosal flap. Before we do that, we pass the intubation tube through the upper and the lower punctum. Gently it is passed and it is retrieved from the nose. So this is the nasal lacrimal uh, intubation which has been performed and this has been tied inside the nose. We suture the sac flap and the nasal mucosal flap with 6-0 sutures. Once you've done the intubation, 
we suture the orbicularis and the skin. We leave this tube in place for um, a couple of months. We do a small bandage, insert some uh, local antibiotic. And this tube can be removed over a period of say three to six months. Now endoscopy is a very important part of our treatment. We should use a periodic endoscope in all these cases so that we have a direct visualization of what we are doing. So periodic endoscope is usually 2.7 millimeters and it comes in 0, 30 and 60 degrees. Important indications for using a periodic endoscope are during probing and intubation. It can be used in an adjunct to DCR or when you are performing an endonasal DCR or when one is doing a marsupialization of intranasal cysts associated with dactrocystocene. The success uh, when we do an endoscopic procedure rises as high as 94.4% in follow-ups more than six months. So here we're doing a infracture of the inferior turbinate. So this is what we do and we should always do it under visualization with the endoscope. This is a very easy and a portable endoscopic machine which we use uh, in the OPDs to look inside the nose or even in the OTs when you're doing small procedures. So here it, one can see that there is the uncinate process and the middle turbinate and the maxillary bone and this is the location of the lacrimal sac. So in conclusion, lacrimal disorders in children as you mirrored manifestations, the commonest problem is a congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction and successful management is possible in most of these cases. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for such uh, an extensive coverage of the topic. Uh, we have a few questions uh, which have come up on our uh, portals. Uh, starting with, uh, I'll just proceed to ask you the questions. Uh, how Up to how many times can probing be performed before uh, managing with a more definitive uh, methods such as balloon catheter dilatation or DCR in pediatric CNLDO? If the first probing is unsuccessful, it is always a good idea to go for a second probing, but preferably with nasolacrimal duct intubation. If even that fails, and then we should we can go ahead with other procedures like a, a balloon catheter uh, dilatation, which is which is difficult to perform in our scenario because of uh, lack of uh, resources, or we can go for a pediatric DCR. But a pediatric DCR we should do only after the child is at least three years of age, not in a very young child. Then what is the earliest age when probing can be performed? Probing can be performed as early as three months to six months. If there is an urgent need, like uh, if the child needs intraocular surgery, like a cataract surgery, where we are forced to do a probing, because we want to make sure that there is no focus of infection. But ideally, we'd like to wait till about one year of age. Okay, sir. So then uh, the next question is... Uh... Management, is there any specific management protocol for congenital nasolacrimal fistulas? Uh, if the fistula is asymptomatic, one can leave it alone. Or when the child is grows older, we can always go ahead and uh, do an excision or a fistulectomy. But if there is presence of a uh, lot of discharge, and if the child is symptomatic, then definitely we can go ahead with an earlier surgery. We do a fistulectomy. And if there is a associated nasolacrimal duct obstruction, you can always do a DCR along with that. So fistulas uh, on their own are usually asymptomatic. So, so the next question we have is, in case of hyperosteosis, what is the ideal management protocol? Hyperosteosis of? Of the nasal cavity or like when we are uh, probing, if we feel that the probe is not passing through. Okay, so uh, if you feel that the probe is not passing through, we should ideally do a nasal endoscopy and see what kind of obstruction is there. Is it because the uh, the inferior turbinate is extremely close or it is obstructing the nasolacrimal duct opening? That is what we should do. And uh, then we can go ahead and do a probing. And if we feel that the obstruction is very uh, problematic, we can definitely do an infracture of the inferior turbinate so that we get an access. That is how we should go ahead when there is an excess bone in the nasal cavity. Yes, sir. Uh, for our postgraduate residents, I wanted to just uh, ask you to reiterate the points of the Krigler's massage, which we often tell most of the mothers to perform on the child. 
So the Krigler's massage is a hydrostatic massage where we are pressing the contents of the sac downwards. So if there is a membranous obstruction, it is likely to open up. It may not hap happen with a complex obstruction or with a bony obstruction. So in this, we are trying to press the contents of the sac in a downward direction. So starting some, uh, say about one or two millimeters above the middle canthus, between the eye and the nose is the presence of the fundus of the sac. We press it downwards and outwards and laterally gently as if we are squeezing the contents downwards. So this should be done maybe 10 to 40 times in a day. Adequate cleaning of the eye is important because a lot of discharge is likely to come. So once we do the massage, we should definitely clean the eye and install an antibiotic if there is active infection. So this is the Krigler's massage which we need to do. Many times we have noted that patients massage the nose or the eye or just massage the cheek. So proper technique is important and many times it is successful. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, next we have, uh, what is the ideal gap between an episode of ac acute dactrocystitis and uh, intervening surgery like DCR? Ideally, ideally, we should not do any kind of surgery if there is an acute infection. But sometimes if there is a lacrimal abscess, we can definitely go ahead and do an endoscopic DCR kind of procedure, which is very successful. But if it is a simple infection, there's not much of an abscess, we can always wait for that. And once the infection completely heals, uh, we can go, go ahead with surgery. The problem is when you do surgery, when there is acute infection or inflammation is when one cannot differentiate the various layers, like the, the layers, like the sac, everything's so inflamed and bloody that it's very difficult to perform a good surgery. So it's always ideal to wait till the infection completely subsides before we go ahead with any kind of definitive surgery. Okay, sir. Thank you. Uh... So we, I have a question. If you don't have an endoscopy uh, uh, guidance like in uh, setup, if you are working, how do we go about the infracture, the middle, middle uh, like the turbinate infracture? Okay. So it is not so difficult to identify the inferior turbinate. So uh, when we look at the nose, uh, the patient is lying on the bed and we look vertically down on the nose and we can trace it down in the nose and we can look uh, laterally, we'll get the inferior turbinate. So once we get the inferior turbinate, gently one can push it in the inward direction. So with direct visualization also, we can do it. Ideally, we should do it with endoscopy because we have a lot of portable endoscopes which are very cost-effective and cheap. So we can definitely afford that. But uh, even otherwise, if you don't have an endoscope, even then, maybe uh, like 10, 15 years ago, we used to do it directly, uh, visualization. So what we used to do is we pull the, uh, push the tip of the nose slightly up and we visualize directly into the nose and we can see the inferior turbinate. Gently, we take that uh, lens spatula, any kind of spatula or any kind of retractor, periosteal retractor, and we just gently push the inferior terminate towards the uh, septum or the medial side. Very so much possible. Post-op care after the infracture, legs. So what happens once you do the infracture, there's likely to be bleed. So immediately, one should pinch the nose. As a doctor, one should pinch the nose and wait. Definitely, we have access to uh, nasal decongestant, like say, Otrovin Pediatric, uh, nasal drops. So usually I insulate before I do any kind of procedure like this. Wait for one or two minutes and then I do this procedure. And again, once the bleeding stops, I put one or two drops of water in and make sure that there is no bleeding. So this is how we have to prevent bleeding because bleeding can be a big problem. Mm -hmm. So when we do uh, these kind of procedures in a very small child, ideally we should do a cuffed endotracheal tube, preferably with packing of the throat. If it is mm -hmm. possible. Even though cuffed endotracheal tube compared to a laryngeal mask airway is safer, but still it is always a good idea to do a throat pack. Yeah. If you have adequate time, then you can always do a nasal pack like we do for a DCL, then one can go ahead. But otrovin or any kind of nasal decongestant like Nesivion also works well in when we would want to do these small procedures. If it is a proper DCR, then ideally we would do a nasal packing with proper decongestants like adrenaline and other and lignocaine. And so any difference between the adult, like any uh, special points to take care when we are doing uh, pediatric DCR? Yeah, it's very Especially important. Especially very young children if it is uh, needed. So it's very important not to go very high, like not go very high above the medial canthal tendon. That is one. Because you might hit the cribble from platelets pretty low in children. The area or the, the facial anatomy is, is very compact and it is a small face. 
second is uh, one should be very very conscious about bleeding which is happening one cannot ignore it one should be very alert about how much blood is coming out and what's happening the bones are very fragile if you are not concentrating properly it's very likely you'll go in a wrong direction even the sinuses and the ethmoids and all are not developed properly so it's very likely you might go in the wrong place so one should be very alert surgery is very easy because bones are easy to break and punch that way it's very easy and uh, so we have to very be very very alert about the anatomical landmarks number 2 uh, prevent possible complications like hitting the cribriform plate or going in the wrong direction or going too much into the sinuses and always be aware of blood loss in children uh, and sir i just hi sir uh, hi. very nice presentation Thank i you. just wanted to ask you what's the role of mmc in uh, pediatric cases so people have used mmc in pediatric cases though i'm not particularly fond of mmc because we don't want any kind of untoward complications what i do is i routinely intubate all my children so it is 100% lacrimal intubation for all the children to avoid failures and generally failures don't happen because the ostium is quite adequately sized and make sure i make proper flaps and uh, do proper lavage and remove all the blood and any kind of uh, material which is lying inside so not much inflammation happens i also uh, ask the anesthetist to give a one shot of dexamethasone iv because anyway there is an anesthetist available so that we can reduce the inflammation and uh, uh -huh. you... sorry please go please, ahead please no please you please go ahead yes so when we are doing pediatric dcr like in adult cases sometimes we inject uh, lignocaine adrenaline in the before we make the nasal flap do you do that even in pediatric cases or avoid that step so what happens is uh, the nasal pack which i do before surgery is the most crucial step for me because that is what really helps me in preventing bleeding not only in children but also in adults so using 4% lignocaine and adrenaline in adequate concentration like breaking an ampule and putting inside uh, we just pack the nose properly right up to the top like right to the region of the nasal uh, the sac so this nasal packing actually has been preventing bleeding and most of the times bleeding is not an issue in children because their blood pressure is not very high so it's not a very big issue in children so i don't usually have to inject uh, any kind of uh, thing into the nasal mucosal flap unlike adults with adults if i do a proper packing i get away with without much bleeding but many adults have associated systemic problems like hypertension some people have been on blood thinners for a long time and so these things are all contributory factors which lead to bleeding in adults but children i get away with bleeding most of the times and so what's the youngest stage that you have done a dcr on sorry youngest Young stage days. yeah maybe 2 years okay sir so, like you mentioned probing have done sorry probing have done up to 2 to 3 months of age just okay. to do cataract surgery right for the cataract surgery is it when i mean uh, do you wait for a couple of weeks or something to make sure that you know it's patent enough before you go ahead with the cataract surgery after just probing or like would you consider early dcr in any case uh, uh it's a, if it, uh, you mean to say that i i'm supposed to do cataract surgery in a very young child and i have to do a probing like there is a block and you've done the probing but because you need to go ahead with the cataract surgery do if if you've um kind of made sure that it is patent on table after probing how early do you go ahead with the cataract surgery do you still wait to ensure that you don't need to do a repeated probing or something usually we do the cataract surgery in a week's time because okay. that was the only reason why i did the probing and usually okay. this probing is very easy in a small child 2 3 months of age is extremely easy you just pass the probe it will open okay it's extremely easy and it's unlikely there will be any kind of blockage again okay. Okay, sir. I think in pediatric cases, amblyopia is a big consideration to make, right? Uh, we, it, 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 is, it also seems that uh, yeah, it also seems that congenital nasal nasal lacrimal obstruction on its own is also associated with some kinds of amblyopia. Okay, there's a strong association between them. So I think nasal lacrimal obstruction should also be treated early mm. instead of sitting on it for ages. Mm. Sir, so in uh, pediatric patient in Down's uh, Down syndrome patients, um, what are the uh, you know 
particular findings or what special uh, uh, points to be kept in mind since they're kind of might be different anatomically. Down syndrome patients, uh, many times you have uh, problems of the lid also. So punctal agenesis could be there uh, sometimes or one puncta could be present, one puncta would be absent. The nasal anatomy is extremely, uh, it's, it's totally different in Down syndrome because they have a very flat nose. So probing uh, is not very easy in Down syndrome. It can be very tricky in Down syndrome. So uh, we always tell the parents that there is a chance that probing may not be successful. In other cases, we may not be so emphatic that probing will not be successful. But in Down syndrome, I'm extremely clear and tell them that because the nasal anatomy, the entire anatomy is different, there's a chance that probing may not be successful. Otherwise, so, and Down syndrome obviously has more incidence of nasal electron duct and other watering anomalies and lid abnormalities also overall. So even when the uh, kids have uh, like hypertelorism, uh, do we suspect like a more of a bony block and we should uh, tell the parents that it might uh, yes. fail, the probing might fail? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think there's there's hypertelorism or any such kind of bony abnormality. Then definitely we should warn the parents that if there is, it could be likely be a complex or a bony obstruction, and therefore it's likely to fail. And we may have to go for a definitive procedure like a DCR a couple of years down the line. Any role of imaging in those cases, sir? Before we go in for a probing or uh, a slightly more conservative treatment that we are trying to think, even then, should we ask the parents to for the child to undergo imaging? If you are thinking like that. Definitely. Uh, imaging is useful because nowadays we have got both CT DCG and uh, MR DCG. So it's very useful. Uh, we even have access to lacrimal scintillography in my city, which we can do to look for any punctal anomalies and punctal movement of the dye and the radioactive trace. Uh, we have all these uh, things available, but we use it sparingly. So if it is a very complex uh, case, say a case of trauma, accident, where we are not very sure about what is happening, we can definitely go ahead with a CT DCG or a MRI DCG, MR DCG, that will be really helpful to understand what is happening. Mm -hmm. uh, sir, in kids, when you intubate, you remove the uh, intubation after like four to six weeks itself mm -hmm. or do you keep it for a longer period? Yeah, so there are variable uh, reports, like some people advocate that we should remove it by four to six weeks. Uh, some people say use it for three months or up to even up to six months. But most studies say that don't keep it for a very long time. Because the longer you keep, then you start creating failure. So after one year of age, it is definitely going to reduce the success of your procedure. So I think ideal time is between maybe four to six weeks to up to max six months. By that time, one should remove the tube. Because the nasal uh, biofilm will be created. Anyways, there's a biofilm is going to get created. And uh, so everything will settle down eventually. Okay, sir. And um, what is the empirical antibiotic that you suggest when, you know, very young kids come with a NLD? Most of us end up using tobramycin in these cases. That is what we use. And sometimes we feel that if it's not working very well, we always give moxifloxacin also for these children. But to use antibodies sparingly, uh, mostly we depend on uh, pressing the sac, regurge, uh, remove all the contents, all the dirty contents from the sac, clean the eye, and do a massage. That is what I emphasize. Instead of using too much of uh, antibiotics and creating resistance. Okay. Actually, exactly. pediatricians also prescribe uh, Vigamox and all to parents. And I think they come using it for like two, three months. Two, three months. Exactly. They're yeah. like using it. And uh, even like, I think the pediatricians also sometimes say that whenever you do the massage and if it's like a mucoid yeah, you thing, use it with it. Use a, uh, I think that should uh, not be done. Yeah, the pediatrician uh, like they end up using it for months altogether and there's no use because it's not working anyways because there is a mechanical block which is not being bypassed so eventually it doesn't work parents have to be counseled about not using drops too much so parents are told clearly that use drops antibiotic drops only if there is yellowish discharge there's some kind of inflammation that started to occur in that region like some kind of erythema over the skin then definitely use drops and uh, when do you send uh, the discharge for a swab specifically for culture sensitivity or something? If there is a profound uh, mucopurulent discharge and we're cleaning it in and using drops and still it is not becoming watery in nature, then uh, we definitely think of sending it for uh, 
the can the discharge for culture sensitivity so in a routine uh, case we may not do all these uh, treat uh, these investigations but only when we feel that uh, this mucopolin discharge the change of the character of this discharge to a water discharge is not happening with antibody drops and definitely we can think of culture sensitivity of the discharge okay, also can you tell us some uh, thing more about amniontoseal or the dacryoseal which is like a, a important differential from uh, acute dacrocystitis or like a tense cystic mass in the lacrimal sac area. So an amniotoseal is usually filled with amniotic fluid and it is going to happen in the newborn. Yeah, even a dacrocele, again, a similar thing, which may have a serous fluid. And again, uh, this is also going to happen in newborn. There's no inflammation as such. So it is a very bluish kind of cyst and uh, child is not usually symptomatic. Many times just with massage it will resolve. Rarely we end up getting a blockage of the nasal passage because it's, it's become a very large cyst. And we can get away with probing. Even even in the, uh, even in, I should say, in the OPD setup or even the hospital setup, not under general anesthesia, we can even get away with probing on an OPD basis, not under general anesthesia. But when we have an acute dacrocystitis, definitely it is an infected situation. A lot of discharge is present. There could be redness, erythema, swelling in the region of the lacrimal sac area, which are all pointers of acute inflammation. So, in which case, uh, these are the kind of uh, these are the features which will help differentiate these two. The acute dacrocystitis usually happens in a much later uh, uh, in the life of the child. It does not happen usually immediately after birth. It will happen mm -hmm. usually about three weeks or four weeks or a couple of weeks after that. It will not happen immediately. So amniotoseal is basically it's a clinical diagnosis, like clinical a blue diagnosis. cystic mass. And, uh, yes, and most of the time it's not an emergency. It usually resolves at the time. Only rarely you might have faced a situation where there's a block and you called. In which case, just take a probe and just pass it and watch what's happening. Usually it will resolve immediately. OPT set up like under restraint. Huh? Like under restraint. Like yes, under restraint. And just under, restraint. Probe. under restraint with all the doctors in attendance like the pediatrician and everybody else in attendance we can do it okay <laughs> Ritka, you were asking something no no i think we are good um that was a really uh nice class on okay, but it's like so important because parents come with so much worry for thing like that even for a massage and everything yeah yeah yeah, yeah. thank you so much sir thank you it's a very basic topic so I think we really enjoyed this lecture a lot. You know everything about it. <laughs> no, we sir. see it like commonly, but uh, even like a, a simple thing like telling them. Actually, parents even have questions what to massage with. Like coconut oil should be used. Should right. we use a, a ointment, like a moxie ointment? How to do that? And like many times they actually empty the sack and come. So it's again a challenge when you have to demonstrate it in the clinic to them. So how do you, and child is anyways cranky and not cooperative. So that's another thing. So another question should, uh, should the FDTT should be done in all the cases? Like, do you recommend that or just like a pressing the sack and regurgitation uh, is good enough? I think regurgitation is good enough because that is a very conclusive kind of uh, test along with the symptoms of the child and the history which we get from the parents. There is a problem. FDT is not a. It's it's more like a textbook thing, which we like. Diet disciplines just as a more like a textbook thing. I think we don't have to do it in the clinic routinely. Mm -hmm. Because uh, actually, so children... plus is it's a very good diagnosis. I think mm -hmm. very important diagnosis too. Challenging thing is the child will start crying just when you like approach them. So it's difficult to even like diagnose. <laughs> Like confidently sometimes when the child is very cranky and the parents the trick, are apprehensive. Yeah, the tri tricky thing is the mother will clean the child just before she enters your chamber. So everything yeah. is clean and absolutely clean and they come and say, then you wonder why they've come. <laughs> so that is the problem. So usually I demonstrate the massage on a family member, not on the child. Mm. Because they feel very sensitive or very uh, positive over the child. So always just demonstrate on a family member. Like the husband or the like the father or the mother or the grandmother or the grandfather. It's easier that way. So in a child with acute dacrocystitis, what is the uh, systemic antibiotic of choice which would be preferred for, chi for children? Uh, in children, uh, normally I end up giving augmentin. It's amoxy with clavulanic acid. Sometimes, uh, nowadays we have faced a few cases where we had to give higher antibiotics like linozolid. 
So in all these very uh, tiny children who are like few kilos, I usually take the help of the pediatrician for calculating the dosage. In adults, it's very easy because I prescribe tablets. So I, I prescribe like augmented 625 milligrams or linozole at 600 milligrams. But in children, always I take the help of the pediatrician just to be on the safe side. So most of them will respond to amoxiclav. A few of them might need higher antibiotics like linozole. I think we can call it a day because yeah. thank uh, you very much. Yes, uh, interesting discussion, sir. Thank you so much. Um, uh, just to make an announcement, a quick one. Uh, we come back on third November with uh, a lecture by Dr. Uh, Mohammad Javed Ali on the overview and management of diseases of the canaliculi.